Good afternoon, and welcome to this session about Hinduism. Again, if you're here at the Clark for questions after the lecture, please wait for the microphone to be brought to you so people can hear you. And in Great Barrington, just speak up, and you'll be heard uh, here as well. The roots of Hinduism date back thousands of years with the settlement of Aryan tribes from Central Asia in the Indus River Valley of India. They brought with them the Vedic religion and an early form of the Indo-European language known as Sanskrit. The primary scripture of Hinduism is contained in ancient texts known as Vedas, which tradition holds to be of the same age as the universe. They contain hymns, incantations, and rituals, and are regarded as divine revelations and recited as sacred utterances or mantras. Although they are the primary texts of Hinduism, the Vedas had a vast influence on Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism, which evolved later. Now, this philosophy was, was upgraded or developed further to the point where uh, it was developed the concept of a single divine essence, Brahman, that was pervading the universe and that the human soul is a manifestation of this divine essence and that spiritual emancipation consists of knowing the essential unity of self and the universe. Now through the centuries Hinduism evolved from the very primitive based upon the various forces of nature into this essential unity of self and universe. By the time this concept was developed Hindus were worshiping a multitude of nature, family, and tribal gods. The Hindu world is filled with gods that resemble humans and animals, as well as demons, heroes, ghosts, and heavenly dancing girls. This proliferation extends to the forms which these gods take for example, one with a thousand eyes, Brahma with four heads, and another with 16 arms. And these depictions are intended to focus attention on the particular attributes of the deity. Now, I know that you received a great deal of reading material prior to this course, and if you have not had the time to go through it, I would urge you to do so uh, following this lecture. It is really fascinating reading. There are many unusual and interesting aspects of this story, and we have extended the class time for this session to two hours, so we will go from now through 2.30 to maximize the time for our wonderful scholar, Professor Indira Peterson. Uh, we are very grateful to her for coming from Mount Holyoke, where she is the David B. Truman Professor of Asian Studies, and the Five College 40th Anniversary Professor. She is a Tamil speaker by heritage. She grew up in Bombay and studied several Indian and foreign languages, including Sanskrit, uh, Marathi, German, and Russian. She received her BA <coughs> with honors in English literature from Bombay University and her master and PhD in Sanskrit and Indian, Indian studies from Harvard. She's a well-known scholar of classical Sanskrit and Tamil literature and Hinduism and South Indian classical music and cultural history, including the classical, medieval, colonial, and modern periods. She has published extensively in these areas, far too many publications to even begin to list them in this kind of a brief introduction. She has held fellowships from the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Institute for Indian Studies, the Social Science Research Council, the German government's Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and the Rockefeller Foundation. Professor Peterson, it's an honor to have you with us today. We deeply appreciate it your major contribution to this program of ours. Please accept this very humble offering of ours, the uh, 
famous Ali cup. I'm sure oh. about 5,000 years from now. I'll start using the, it right the, now. <laughs> the archaeologists will, will look on this as uh, a very historical piece. Oh, thank you so much. What a nice cup. Just what I need for my office. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Uh, is this all right? Uh, let me know if I need to move this mic or do anything. Thank you so much for a gracious introduction. And uh, as I said, please don't hesitate to tell me to correct something if you can't hear me or anything, because I wouldn't know. Let me um, minimize this and get to the get to my lecture topic. Uh, I see Pissarro. I'm not lecturing on Anastasia or Pissarro. Hinduism, that's me. Okay. <laughs> I would love to lecture on Prasara, and I'm very upset that I had to miss the great exhibition, which ended just two days before this talk, and I couldn't come any earlier. Anyway, um, welcome to all of you to, who are so kind as to come and uh, hear me here. Uh, what I did was I prepared a... Um, I'm teaching a class on Hinduism, and I think you saw the website. That's the website where it's my ongoing class on Hinduism, which I've taught for a very long time at Mount Holyoke. I have this year, I think, about 30 students, and they're all very good. They're very interesting students. And we have ongoing conversations on the website about um, you know, the things that we read and talk about and view week after week. And I just have it there just so that, in case I want to show you something there, I could quickly go back to that site. But basically, there's nothing you need to do except to uh, sit and relax. And um, what I'm going to do is to share with you what I'm teaching in that entire semester. I'm trying to just show you the highlights uh, as quickly as possible, in as brief a time as possible, given that this is all we have. And I hope that that will whet your appetites to study Hinduism further, learn more about it, and that's my goal and hope. Let's begin with um, well, what Hinduism is. I'm not going to try to define it, but how we study Hinduism is perhaps something that I could say something more about. And it's nothing to do with this visual here. It's a story. The story is that one of my classmates at Harvard at the Divinity School and for the Center for the Study of World Religion, um, when was that, 1971 to 1976, um, Vasudha Narayanan is a scholar of South Indian Hinduism, and she became the first, I think the first woman president of the American Academy of Religion at a very young age. In any case, she wrote a very interesting essay uh, in the American Academy of Religion journal uh, talking about how, how to study Hinduism and how not to study Hinduism. She told a very amusing story for, to which I had been a witness in our student days at the Divinity School. She came and met an American student who said he was studying the Vedas, which Art Sherman just spoke about, this ancient text which are so old. And she said, oh, yes, well, my family, I'm a Brahmin, my family recites the Vedas, so which, which uh, part of the Vedas are you studying? And he said, um, well, Vritra and the battle with Indra, and Vasudha says, my heart sank. I'd never heard of Vritra. <laughs> because this is such an ancient text, there are so many stories. This particular story was not an important one for modern Hindus, so she hadn't heard for it, heard of it. But then she said to him, Do you know when you study about this, do you study about lentils? He said, Lentils? What do you mean lentils? And she said, you know, the food that you make for the gods, my grandmother, for the festival of the goddess, which is happening right now. This is the fourth or fifth day of the festival. No, so the seventh day of the festival. And two days, the goddess festival will be complete. It coincides with the autumn harvest. And the goddess is worshipped as the goddess of the crops, the earth mother. And every day of these nine days of the festival, the women of the household sprout grains and lentils because that is the prediction for the harvest to come. And the goddess blesses the grains and lentils and the women cook them in simple ways and it's called shundal, which means a lentil stir fry. And then they distribute it to everybody who comes to their homes to celebrate the goddess. So Vasudha said, do you know about the lentils? And he said, no, I have no idea. 
And so Vasudev's article was basically, let's read all the sacred text and the ancient text and the philosophies, but please, let's also bring the lentils in. So that's what I do in my course. I actually distributed lentils yesterday to my class, and we all ate the consecrated food, so let's begin on that note. So I will first go through the... Um, Oh, thank you, slideshow. I'm very glad you, you remembered that. Thanks, that's much better, much nicer view for you. Um, let's just go through the Hinduism, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the format that I follow. We first begin with the ancient texts, because historically you can't start without starting with the older layer of Hinduism, but it's more important than that. These texts, regardless of how distant, how remote, how unknown they may be to ordinary Hindus directly, they still permeate and influence modern Hinduism to the very core, and I'll try to explain how that works. And after that, I will go into the particular trajectory of the growth of Hinduism, but looking at, as I said, particular highlights such as practice, how do Hindus worship, how do Hindus practice, and how does all this relate to their worldview? This is what all the readings, the short handouts and readings that you will have received in photocopy have to do with that. I also want to tell some stories and sing some songs which are part of the Hindu tradition because this is how religion is lived. Performance, singing, prayer, worship, sharing, and uh, experiencing, not just texts. But the texts are very important, and indeed, other texts come into play through these kinds of things. So, uh, the first thing um, I would do is to start with a prayer, which is an ecumenical universal prayer that students uh, and teachers sang together or chanted together in the ancient period of the Upanishads, which was around 900 before Christ to about the first century AD, when teachers and students uh, sat together as in Plato's Academy or Socrates' uh, disciple circle and they thought about the soul and the self and existence. This is what they sang. Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunattu Sahaviriyam Karavavahai Tejasvina Vadhita Mastu Ma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 The translation is up there. May we be protected together, may we enjoy learning together, may we act purposefully together, may our learning be effulgent, may we not disagree acrimoniously, meaning let us disagree, but not acrimoniously. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. The central characteristics of Hinduism are an emphasis on universal sacrality and human perfectibility. In Hinduism, for the most part, Hindus believe that all is sacred. Material nature, the universe, the cosmos, God comes into this at some point, we'll talk about that, and the human self, all of this is sacred. Everything is sacred, but how the sacred sees itself and sees itself in relation to other forms of the sacred is what makes for the variety of Hinduism. Third, Hinduism is also characterized by its encouragement of the idea of the multiple personal pathways to spiritual fulfillment and even religious practice, even everyday practice is diverse. Within a single household, it is possible to have multiple practices. I would call this a pragmatic pluralism because there are many other aspects of Hinduism which may seem very fixed and even rigid, and indeed they are. For example, the caste system. It was very rigid. And other things such as status hierarchy, uh, rules and regulations of purity and pollution, they're very, very strict, but there is this immense flexibility, which is also a problem for the outsider. Another parable, a Jain parable, Jain, Jainism is the third ancient religion of India, first Hinduism or the Vedic religion, Buddhism, and then the Jains. The Jain parable was about how knowledge is never certain and knowledge is never complete. Hinduism is just like that. The parable was that six blind men were taken into a room. 
to describe and experience an elephant. They were blind, they couldn't see it. So of course one of them said it's big and broad like a wall, you can imagine the rest. The other one said it's tall like a pillar, and the other one said, oh, it flaps like a fan, you know, the ears of the elephant. But none of these is the elephant. So we can't deal with the Hindu elephant in its entirety at, at any given point, nor can we say that the tail or the, or the legs or the ear are Hinduism itself. So we must remember that you will always encounter somebody or something. Even in my class yesterday, when I said, so what do you go, go do for the Goddess Festival? Five Hindus said five different things. And the other students just looked and said, what do they believe in that is common? And that's what I'm trying to you know, show. Plurals as well as common beliefs. Ritual. Contemplative and ascetic streams in Hinduism established in early Hindu sacred texts. The Hindu holy man or the holy man figure is a ubiquitous, it's almost a cliche, you know, long bearded people, naked sadhus with uh, uh, loincloths. Uh, at the end of my talk, I have Mahatma Gandhi who tried his best to live as any Hindu holy man would live, and he did wear just a loincloth. So this idea of asceticism, that is depriving the senses and disciplining the body and mind to achieve something transcendent is really, really part of Hinduism. And this is established in the early Hindu text and it continues into present day Hinduism. The Vedas, which Dr. Sherman mentioned, the Sanskrit Vedas, circa 1200 BC, texts said to be divinely and orally revealed to Brahman sages. These are the highest caste and the highest class even today because they have had this revealed sacred knowledge. They're like rabbis or priests, but they are divinely ordained. This is the sound form of divine knowledge mantra, the chant, Om. It's considered to be the sound manifestation of some cosmic, divine, sacred, and words are only the next level. This is the quasi-inchoate level of the cosmic um, uh, knowledge and reality. So then the mantra is the divine word which has revealed the ancient hymns of prayer and ritual formulae for sacrifices to the cosmic gods. There are nature gods, and uh, I mentioned that in the Vedas, the entire cosmos is sacred. Let me read just a couple of lines from one Veda hymn, and this is the hymn to dawn. The light has come, dawn as in early morning. The light has come of all the lights, the fairest. The brilliant light has been born effulgent, urged onward for God's sun's uprising. Night now has yielded up her place to the morning. Bringing a radiant calf, she becomes resplendent. To her, the black one has given up her mansions akin, immortal, following to each other, morning and night fare on, exchanging colors. Bright leader of glad sounds, she shines effulgent. Widely she has unclosed for us her portals. Pervading all the world, she shows us riches. Dawn has awakened every living creature. These are beautiful hymns. And uh, if I can um, minimize this without too much trouble, um, I have to do escape, but no, where's escape? Escape, escape, yeah. Um, and minimize this for a moment. I will play the Vedic chants. And how do I start the chants? Oh, the, I don't know how to stop this, so I'll stop it here. Yeah, I think that stopped it. Good. Okay, now how do I get out of this? Uh, Windows Media Religion Microsoft. Very good. Here we go. And now I'll get back to the slideshow. Uh, excuse me, technology always takes a minute. You'll just have to bear with me. Can I find the slideshow? There's the slideshow. Okay. So the Vedas. Um, they were maintained in an unbroken oral tradition of memorization and chanting. The thing you need to know is that the Vedas were chanted like this and the Brahmins memorized the entire corpus of 
thousands and thousands of hymns which were used in rituals, and these hymns are still continued in that oral tradition. They were never written down till the uh, medieval, late medieval and early modern period, the 17th century or so, because they were divine revelation. So the prodigious memory of the Brahmins made them looked upon as gods because they walked around with all this knowledge of how to do the rituals and all the myths of the gods and the stories. Now, the idea of mantra, and uh, these are the continuities. First, right ritual action maintains the relationship between gods and humans in a divinely ordained social, moral, and cosmic order in the ancient Veda. Even to this day, ritual action, many Hindus believe, is the way in which to keep the cosmos in balance between God, nature, and self. So that ritual part has never left Hinduism. The ascetic part will be coming, but the ritual part, that is everyone must perform their duties, social duties, their cosmic duties to the gods, and keep doing everything according to rule, is very much a part of Hinduism. The continuities are knowledge, uh, sorry, this is a peculiar thing, I don't know. There. Hold on one second. I have a pointer which I brought, so I'm just going to use the pointer because otherwise it doesn't work. Um, I have a, a laser pointer which, which I can use to point at things. Um, okay, so the right ritual action maintains the relationship uh, between all of these orders. I don't have time to go into this, but there's actually a, a, hymn, uh, a hymn in which the whole of the universe is said to come from a primeval cosmic man, a giant like man with a thousand heads and a thousand arms. And from each of the body parts of this cosmic, metaphoric man come everything in the universe, the parts, the seasons, the time, the sun, the moon. So the, the birth, the moon and the sun are Chandra Mamanaso Jatosh Chakshu Suryo Ajayata Mukhadindrascha Nitya Pranadvayurajayata and all of the social system is born from the head, the Brahmins are born from the head, the soldiers are born from the arms, the merchants and agriculturists from the hip and the thighs, and then finally the servants and the slaves from the feet. This is the Hindu caste system, so it is divinely ordained. So this hierarchical social order becomes a, uh, this hierarchical social order becomes a way of thinking throughout Hinduism. Then separate duties for each caste. You already saw Brahmins can only think and learn, and warriors can only fight and uh, do bodily things, and uh, others are born to serve, and the others are born to maintain the society. This is it. And within the caste system, you have to get married within your own caste so that you can maintain the purity and the rules and regulations of each caste. A very tightly compartmentalized system. And this is one of the banes of Hinduism, as we shall see. This is the Varna system. Within this, thousands and thousands of castes are born according to each occupation. A potter is called a potter caste. A tailor is of the tailor caste. Uh, you know, a washerwoman is a washerwoman caste. So everything is religiously ordained. Now, this was not a good situation. And many early thinkers decided uh, they wanted to get out of this. So they want to think about all actions and activities in terms of morality and ethics, good and bad. So all deeds, uh, good, all deeds, good and bad, uh, have repercussions that each soul must live through in a chain of action and rebirth. What does this mean? Anytime you do something, it has both good and bad results. And in order to, for these results to be born by your soul, the soul has to be reborn in an embodied form. So bodies are ultimately bad, and birth is ultimately bad. There's no final death. You are condemned to be in this roller coaster forever, always circling from birth to birth. One a philosopher of the 8th century put it like this, once again birth, once again death, once again lying in the mother's womb. Punarapi jananam, punarapi maranam, punarapi this is samsara, he said. Let's get out of this. 
So, the earliest philosophers to do that were the philosophers of the 13 principal Upanishads, and there are many more. Upanishad means a secret teaching or mystic doctrine. These are dialogues in which the teaching of the knowledge of the true identity of the individual soul as an essential divine unitary spirit pervading the universe is taught. This is a way of understanding that the soul is imperishable uh, and somehow one could achieve this consciousness and then one will never have to be reborn. I cannot explain this to you now. Obviously, if 13 principal Upanishads with hundreds of dialogues between teachers and students, which happened over 800 years in the forests of northern India, have still not answered these questions, I will not be able to give you the answer to how you transcend the human condition that these mystic sages did. Their methods are very interesting, and if we have time at the end, I'll read you a little dialogue. But the dialogic form is wonderful because think again of the dialogues of Plato. You know, it's exactly like that. A uh, young man will come to an older person and say, a teacher, and say, um, oh, oh, I'll, I'll just tell the story of one very briefly. Um, there was a sage who, because of his great knowledge, the Vedas had, uh, had become very wise. Then he realized that ritual action would just keep him in embodied cycles of karma and rebirth, and he wanted to get out of it, so he went to the forest and started meditating and contemplating. And as he did that, he told his wife, he had two wives, he said to them, they were cattle breeders, these early Aryans who came to India and settled and made the Vedic civilization. These cattle breeders, cattle was their wealth. So he said to his two wives, O Katyayani and O Maitreyi, I will divide my cattle and my other possessions between the two of you, and you will live happily ever after. And uh, Maitreyi said, ever after? I don't think so. I know that karma will keep me in coming back and rebirth and embodiment, so please don't fool me with your ever after business. I don't believe in that fairy tale. What I would really like to know is, what are you doing, having given up all these things? What are you going to do? So he says, oh, but, you know, she, she also says, what would my life be like if I had all this cattle? He said, like one who is a householder, one who lives in the world, a worldly life will be yours, oh my dear. She said, what will I do with a worldly life? Just tell me, what is it that you are after? I will go with you, and I want that as well. So the husband then says, Oh, my Maitreyi, you were very dear to me before, but now you have become dearer to me. Come, my dear, and I will teach you. Let us go forth together into the forest, dwell in contemplation, and learn. And then a long dialogue follows. It's a wonderful dialogue about the soul. It's a wonderful technique, and I wanted to just give you a hint of that. B2, a complex of body and mind techniques, yoga in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. Most Americans and most of the world, in fact, seems to think of yoga as a physical discipline and exercise. But yoga was actually devised as a way to control and discipline the continuum of the body and mind in order to steady everything in one's consciousness so that this soul that we talked about earlier, this higher consciousness, can be reached. That cannot be done without physical as well as mental discipline. The first Yoga Sutra says, yo, yoga, uh, the second Yoga Sutra, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodhaha. Yoga is the cessation of the turnings of thought. That thought is what controls us. Now, we control thought. And how do you do that? To be through meditation, contemplation, physical discipline, and psychophysical disciplines, which are taught in the Yoga Sutra. A sutra, as in Buddhism and other Eastern religions, is a brief mnemonic memorizing technique, just a single line, which embodies a whole teaching which has to be gone systematically through. Suppose there are 30 sutras in the first book of the Yoga Sutra, you have to go from one to two to three to four to follow and practice each one of the teachings. And you have to sit with the teacher and learn the teachings and discuss them. So this is the example of the kinds of teachings which in practice are still continuing in Hinduism, not just as a physical discipline, but as a religious discipline. 
The last thing, back to ritual action and the word dharma. Upholding the social order of the cosmos in accordance with scriptural teachings, there are, uh, I'm sorry, that's not many, but Manu. Manu was supposed to be the first human king who wrote down in the first or second century before Christ all the laws of the full-fledged Hindu tradition, which were to be followed by each of the castes, by women, by men, uh, for their ancestors, for the gods, everything is written down here. Of course, in practice, there have been many deviations and many new texts have come up, but Manu is the authority to which the Brahmins would refer you. One other thing, all of these texts are written in Sanskrit, which after a while, only the Brahmins had complete control of. Soon, new languages began to develop after the 800, 900 before Christ. Uh, new dialects, the Buddha preached in a language called Pali, the Mahavira, the teacher of Jainism, taught in another dialect. And soon, by 1000 AD, there were distinct languages and people began to write scriptural texts in their own languages. So Hinduism does not have one god or one scripture. It has multiple manifestations of the divine sacred and it has multiple scriptures used for different purposes. The Upanishads for contemplative, uh, contemplative discipline, the Yoga Sutra and such texts and their commentaries for psychosomatic uh, disciplines, the Ramayana, which is the story, the Mahabharata and Ramayana, which I'm going to talk about in a second, narrative epics and the laws of Manu, are to teach people how to live in this world and live religiously which is a very important thing. It's all very well to say, my dear, let us go forth and go to the forest, but there's a long time when you're living in the world, how do you live in the world? The morality, the action, all of this is important. In the great Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, the song of God, the reconciliation of these two contradictory and conflicting pulls in Hinduism, one, to live righteously in this world, dharma, and the other to escape and be liberated from the cycle of karma. There's a word for that. It's called liberation, um, which is the liberation from the cycle of karma, moksha. Those two goals are almost seem to be contradictory. If you live well in the world, you will achieve good things, won't you? No, you won't. You'll be reborn. So you have to get out of the world. So what do you do while you're in the world? Bhagavad Gita is the song of God and it gives this teaching. It reconciles action and contemplation, uh, life in the world and transcendence over the human, con human condition. And in this scripture, it is a, which is a personal guide to right action and social duty as well as liberation, a divine incarnation, and now we come to the theory of gods and incarnations, which I'll explain in just a minute. The incarnation teaches the epic warrior Arjuna, who stands in for the Hindu every man, how he may both perform his social duty and achieve liberation. And let's see what that teaching is. And if I can find my text, Gita, which I think is in my bag, I will read out, and if not, I have some uh, excerpts here. Krishna teaches Arjuna three disciplines, and he calls them yoga. The word yoga is known by everybody by now, as a contemplative discipline, which is to withdraw from the world and live a life of contemplation. Krishna says, no, you can live life as a yoga, as a discipline. See how you can discipline yourself, and this is what I teach you. The discipline of knowledge, number one. Know your soul is imperishable, and yourself, your actions in this world are part of a cosmic divine network. Number two. The discipline of action, karma yoga. Perform your divinely ordained social duty, which is dharma, as ordained by all the books and everything. You don't have to think it through yourself. But you have to think about one thing. What is that one thing? Renounce greed, covetousness, and desire to, I should say one more thing here, to acquire something for yourself, and to harm others. That is acquisition, acquisitiveness, and the desire to injure other cardinal sins. If you do 
that, you will get bad karma. But if you act altruistically and with love and for the greatest good and not for self-interest, and you sacrifice all your self-interest, then you will not be tainted by karma and you will be liberated as you are living. But there's a third thing to liberation, the discipline of devotion to God. There is this incarnation who has come on earth and this is during the great epic battle of the second epic, the Mahabharata. In this epic, the great clans of northern India around 900 before Christ are fighting with each other and killing each other. Arjuna is asked to kill his own cousins so that he can get the kingdom back. And he says, how can I do this? They are my cousins. And besides, killing is itself bad. So I will only get bad karma. What is your solution? Oh, Krishna, tell me. He doesn't know that Krishna his charioteer and friend is really God. God has come as his charioteer, and that image is very powerful. We'll see that in a minute. God comes as the charioteer and says, get those horses going, get your weapons and go fight in the battlefield, but not to get something for yourself, but for the greater good of all the people. Why? Because in the epic, Arjuna and his brothers are the good guys, and the Mahabharata opponents, his opponents, are the evil princes who have taken their kingdom away from them and they are destroying social harmony. So for the sake of social harmony, Arjuna must fight. This is the, but giving all your actions to Krishna, then you love God and that love makes this sacrifice easier to bear. It doesn't seem like such a burden. It seems as if loving God is like loving all beings because God loves all human beings. This is what he says. This is the most perfect path towards selfless and truly dharmic action in the world. Your liberation is achieved through action itself, done in a truly altruistic spirit, not through selfishly quitting your duty for selfish personal interest. <coughs> there is Krishna leading Arjuna into battle in the Bhagavad Gita. See? And now the Ramayana, the story of Rama, the exemplary man-hero incarnation and his wife Sita, the ideal woman and the, and the perfect devotee Hanuman, the monkey god. This is the most <coughs> beloved of Hindu epics and Hindu stories. Originally, there were two epics. One was the Ramayana and one was this other one that I talked about. Neither of them was just a story, a religious story. They were just folk tales and epic heroic tales. In these stories, all kinds of actions took place, but they were about kings and queens and monarchies and battles over land and the establishment of the Aryan peoples over the North Indian countryside. This, the, the epic histories would have happened as early as uh, 800 or 900 before Christ. The Ramayana was written down in 550 BC by a sage called Valmiki. It was written in Sanskrit, but that is not how Hindus know it. Hindus know it through every language as bedtime stories told by their parents and grandmothers and grandparents, but as, as, uh, as stories that they read in what, what you see here before you, a kind of comic book, which is like the classic comics of India, this Amar Chitra Katha, the great Hindu stories are told here. And this is how modern Indian Hindu kids, especially those who don't know any Indian languages and who live in America and other countries, learn the Ramayana. And the Ramayana traces the, the journey of Prince Rama from his kingdom in Ayodhya, the central story, which some of you may have read already, the story is very simple. It is how the prince was supposed to be the, the king after his father would coronate him because he was the eldest son and he had the right to be king. But his wicked, evil uh, other queen, she's not a stepmother, but like a stepmother, she wants her son to be king and she wants Rama to go in exile and she extorts a promise from the king Dasharatha that he would exile his own son and, and uh, anoint his second son in, uh, on the throne. At this, Rama should have reacted with anger and said, how can you do this? I'm the eldest son and I should be the king. And instead Rama says, yes, father, yes, mother, whatever you say, I accept your, your, your uh, command as my sacred duty. It will be my pleasure to go to the forest for 14 years of exile from the beautiful city of Ayodhya, 
and perhaps be eaten by bears on the way, and certainly meet demons and all kinds of uh, obstacles, what follows is Rama's great odyssey. This is exactly the counterpart to the Homer's odyssey. Rama's odyssey takes place over the great land of India, and it ends up in Sri Lanka, which is this island of Lanka. And the reason he goes there is that, indeed, very bad things happen to all of them. His wife, Sita, is abducted by the ten-headed demon, Ravana, and Rama has to fight demons. He has to uh, ally, ally himself with monkeys. The monkeys become very devoted to him, and one monkey in particular, whom we'll see in just a minute, uh, Hanuman, and uh, uh, finally Sita is found, she's uh, uh, rescued, and Rama goes back after 14 years of exile and becomes king of Ayodhya. What are the meanings of this story? There are many meanings, but I'll just pick out three. The first is Rama has the ideal of righteous and perfect conduct, obeying your father, fighting evil, rescuing your wife, being the perfect householder. Everyone knows who now read the Ramayana, and Valmiki himself said this, that Rama was none other than a divine incarnation of the great preserver god Vishnu. And he had come on earth as Krishna came during the Mahabharata, when evil predominates and the demonic has taken over and dharma is crushed. God must come on earth as a human being and help others understand what human action on work, in the world should be like. So you can see why this is a beloved epic. The other character they love though is Sita. Sita, the wife of Rama, need not have gone to the forest. Only her husband was exiled. But Sita insisted that she would go with him through all deprivation in everything. She gets abducted. She remains faithful to him till the very end. And then she suffers the greatest indignity of all. Her purity, her faithfulness to her husband, her fidelity is, it becomes in the marketplace a matter of speculation and even calumny. So Rama is forced to put her through a fire trial where she enters fire willingly and to prove that she is a chaste and faithful wife. And she emerges out of that. The fire god himself brings her out and says, she's so pure, I cannot burn her. I cannot even touch her. So Sita becomes this great heroine. And then Hanuman, that monkey devotee, he is the one who leaps across the ocean to find Sita, who has been abducted by the demon, finds her and then helps Rama build a bridge across the ocean so that he can fight the demon. So these characters, these myths are very beloved. Here is a manuscript page of a 17th century illustrated Ramayana. The Ramayana was illustrated and spoken and written in many languages and beautiful paintings. Here Rama is consulting with the monkey armies who are going to search north, south, east, and west for Sita. And of course, Sita is found in Sri Lanka, which is in the south. And here you have the best form in which the Ramayana is known in northern India. Every part of India has its own Rama story play. It's Rama dance or it's Rama uh, songs. And everyone knows them, sings them, and recites them. But once a year, during the autumn uh, festival, after the goddess festival, there is the festival of Ram Leela, the play of Rama in northern India. Every village will have a Ram Leela in which the story of Rama and Ravana and Sita are enacted. This is Ram and Sita in a 1950s performance. Here is Ravana, the ten-headed. At the end of the play, his effigy, filled with firecrackers, is set fire to, a huge bonfire is made, and the crackers burst, and victory is celebrated. For many North Indians, this is the new year, the death of evil and the beginning of good because of the victory of Rama. And here is the crowd at the Ramnagar Banaras. The most sacred city of India is Banaras on the banks of the Ganges, and these are devotees at the Ramlila. And here are the two boy actors who play Ram and Sita at this Ramlila, very beautifully de decorated. It is said that women cannot play parts in dramas, partly because of their menstrual impurity. They're not allowed to do religious functions. The second thing is women are not allowed to appear in public, so girls are not allowed either in traditional Hindu society. 
This is why two boys are playing the role. Here is the mask of the actor Hanuman in the Ram Raga Ram Lila. Here is a calendar picture. I'm trying to show you how, and we're going to get into the notion of gods in just a minute, how um, the Hindus do not think of God and goddess as uh, any kind of, uh, you know, very high form, but even a calendar picture can be seen as a divine form. So somebody will tear this picture out of a calendar, a lithograph, and frame it and worship it in their household shrine, which I will show you in just a minute. So every modern medium, even virtual uh, television worship is allowed. Television pujas are done. There are, you know, you can throw virtual flowers and light virtual incense and everything. So Hinduism is a very highly flexible religion, and I'll talk about that. I want to get to that very quickly because I want to finish my talk by two and leave half an hour for discussion and, you know, various other things. I still have plenty of time. Here's Sita's fire ordeal in a painting which was ordered by, uh, in a manuscript commissioned by India's most famous Muslim emperor, the Mughal emperor Akbar. Akbar came to India from Central Asia with his parents and he just got fascinated by Hinduism. He even got all the Hindu texts translated, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, the Bhagavad Gita, and he wanted to know more about it and he loved the stories. And he himself was unlettered, so he made sure that plenty of pictures were made of all the stories. So these are among the most beautiful illustrations. But here is a most horrific moment, the worst side of Hinduism as most people would see it, including many Hindus, that a woman in order to prove her purity has to go through this fire ordeal. The real story in the Ramayana isn't that she's made to go into the fire by Rama. He doesn't do that. He's too good for that. But he more or less implies that she can go wherever she wants because she has been unfaithful to him or so the people say. This, these are the words that he uses. So Sita says, as a good wife, what recourse do I have except to die? So Lakshmana, light a funeral pyre for me. The Vedic Aryans worship fire. The Vedas are fire worship hymns and to this day fire is the witness to the wedding to the of the hindus and finally it is into fire that the body is sent and cremated so sita wants a funeral pyre for herself and when she says that uh, lakshmana the brother of rama lights her a pyre she gets in and then rama and lakshmana are watching on the sides the black one and the white one i'm sorry the black one and the white one and the gods vishnu and shiva are watching on this side. This is Rama and Lakshmana, this is Shiva and Sh uh, Vishnu and Shiva. And the gods come out and say, no, no, Sita is faithful, Sita is untainted, Sita is good. See, even fire cannot touch her. So fire makes a, makes a, a, a thing around her. What I wanted to say there was that uh, Hindus have trouble with the Ramayana as well as loving it. This story of Sita has been rewritten and questioned in so many poems, plays, uh, 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 what was the other thing? Narratives, even modern short stories, they're all about Sita. How could Rama reject Sita is the question which reverberates in the Hindu and Indian mind to this day. And I should also say there's a sequel which is there in the early Ramayana of Valmiki from 550 before Christ, which is written in Sanskrit. In that Ramayana, the sequel, the last chapter called the epilogue, after they go ha back to the kingdom of Ayodhya and Rama and Sita are enthroned and Hanuman, the devotee, is, uh, is uh, devotedly following them, uh, there is a seventh book to the Ramayana in which a very sad story is told. There is unrest and famine in the country and the people once again become restless and they start spreading rumors about the faithlessness of the queen. The queen is guilty, they say. The queen is responsible for the famines, the drought, and the uh, bad lack of prosperity in the kingdom. The king keeps her by his side. That is why uh, it is so bad. So Rama wordlessly accepts this verdict of the people because he's the perfect king as well as the perfect man. And he tells his brother, he says, I cannot tell Sita that I want her to depart, so please tell her a lie, tell her that she's pregnant. Tell the pregnant Sita that you're taking her to the forest for a nice picnic 
so she can enjoy the beauty of the forest without the fear of the demons, which she endured for 14 years. Lakshmana, weeping, takes Sita and takes her to the forest, leaves her at the forest edge, falls at her feet, begs her forgiveness and says, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. It is my king, my brother, who told me to do this. I must obey. So my beloved uh, sister-in-law, please forgive me, please forgive me, and I must go. The end of the story is very interesting because Sita weeps and laments in the forest. She's pregnant and friendless. And the sage Valmiki, who wrote the poem, appears, takes her to his hermitage, and his wives and other women take care of her. She gives birth to twin sons. The sons come back and recite Rama's story to Rama at his court. And Rama says, who are you? And they say, we don't know who our father is, but our mother is Sita. He says, oh, my beloved sons, now I will receive Sita back because she has given me these wonderful sons and these people are no longer talking. So he invites Sita, Valmiki the sage, the two sons and Sita walk towards Rama, who is in the palace at Ayodhya. Rama stands with open arms, but Sita looks at him and says, my Lord, I have given you two sons. I have endured countless difficulties on your behalf. I love you, I have been faithful to you, but my work on this earth is over. I cannot endure anymore. I want to go back to my mother earth. Oh, mother earth, mother earth, the earth splits open, mother earth comes up. Sita is the great earth goddess's daughter, like Proserpine and uh, you know Demeter. And Demeter, earth comes and gathers Sita into her arms and the earth closes and Rama is left with empty arms. The interesting thing is that while people keep debating this fire trial of Sita, they very rarely talk about the second ending because most of them don't know it. After Valmiki, many of the Ramayanas end with the happy ending of Rama and Sita on the throne and they don't even want to talk about this last ending. Think about that. Women in Mithila, which was supposed to be Sita's home kingdom, women in Mithila still do painting, and they are among the only folk artists in India who do painting as a public form of art. This is a picture drawn by a woman in Mithila in the 1980s, and this is Ram, Sita, and his brother Lakshman, the faithful brother who went with Rama, who's also the perfect brother because he'll obey his brother no matter what he's told to do, even exiling his sister-in-law and going into the forest. But the best brother is this brother. Look at him falling at his feet. This is the brother who would have gotten the throne because his mother machinated and got Rama out for 14 years. What does Bharata, this brother, do? He doesn't accept the throne. He goes to Rama and begs him to come back. He says, Rama, Rama, come back. You are my elder. You are the right brother. You should be king. I should be king. Please take the kingdom. Please take the kingdom. And Rama says, no, I have given my father my word. My father is now dead. I have to do my 14 years of penance. And you go back and rule the kingdom for me, please. Bharata says, all right, brother, I will do it. But I won't sit on the throne. Give me your sandals. I'll put them on my head and I'll walk to Ayodhya in ascetic bark garments. And there I will place them on the throne and you will be the ruler and I will sit at your feet and rule as your regent. So these are the uh, pictures that Hindus are telling their children. Be like Sita, be like Bharata, be like Rama. Rama is too perfect, you can't be like Bharata, uh, Rama, but you can be like Lakshmana, you can obey your elder brother, and so on. And uh, this is the woman who drew the pictures. She's drawing. This is in her younger age. This is in recent picture. Here's Hanuman. Hanuman is the most beloved character. The way in which most Hindus and Indians today, it's now a national epic, it's an Indian epic, it's for everyone, it's not just a Hindu epic, and uh, everyone translates it, everyone reads it, Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Jews, everyone. And they don't worry about Rama being a god, they just talk about whether he's a good man or a bad man. It's a, it's a story. Now, Hanuman is beloved because he's Superman. He's the one who flew over to get uh, Sita from Lanka, but here he's doing another feat. When Rama and Lakshmana were almost dying in battle, the physician of the Rama's army said to Hanuman, and said to all of them, I need a healing herb from this great magic mountain 
but the magic mountain is far away and nobody knows where the healing herb is on the mountain. Hanuman says, I'll get it. So he just flies over there and since he doesn't want to waste any time, everyone's dying. So he says, why don't I just lift up the entire mountain and bring it to the physician and he'll figure out what the healing herb is. So this is the backside of the same comic book. And if you go back a few, uh, um, um, I wanted to show, yeah, I wanted to show you. Now you notice the clothing Rama is wearing. What does he look like? Can someone tell me? Does he look like a king? Does he have any kingly attributes? No. You should notice he's wearing an ascetic's yellow robe and the holy beads of an ascetic. So asceticism and householder values, dharma and contemplation, discipline and action are embodied in Rama. Much more even than the Bhagavad Gita, which is a Sanskrit text which some teacher must explain to you. Everyone knows the Ramayana, everyone understands it, everyone relates to it. And dharma, right conduct, right living in this world, and faith in God are taught through this epic. God, God's image, vision, and worship in Hinduism. God is Bhagavan or Ishwara, that is the word. But God has many names and many forms. God is even the goddess. There's a female god. So each of them has a mantra, and these mantras have now become the substitute for the old Vedic mantras which only Brahmins may recite. These Sanskrit mantras, everyone may recite. They are your personal mantras, and they're given to you by your teacher or your elder or your guru. So one of them is Om Namah Shivaya, glory to Shiva. Om Namo Narayanaya, glory to Vishnu or to the goddess, namastasya, 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 namo namaha. Oh goddess, I worship you, I worship you, I worship you. Darshan, seeing the divine as divine beings in embodied incarnate forms, in icons of any other form, in paintings, in pictures, you've already seen several already. Seeing them and relating to them is the lower self in the human world relating to the higher manifestations. Art Shulman said very nicely that the universe itself is manifested in multiple forms. There is no limit to the forms. It can appear as a monkey or it can appear as Rama, but nothing is unsacred. But the higher forms have, as the Bhagavad Gita showed, and I'll talk about that at the end of my talk, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna shows a vision to Arjuna. If I can... Um... I had my text to the Bhagavad Gita, but I can't find it now. But I can just tell you what Krishna said, and then if I find it in my bag or something, I can talk about it. Uh, Arjuna said that Krishna, uh, I mean, Arjuna could not believe that this charity of Krishna was God. What evidence was there that he wasn't just somebody telling him a story? So Krishna said, let me give you a divine eye, and then you can see me. I'll give you darshan, that is my vision. So he shows this incredible vision thousand-armed, thousand-headed, radiant, a million skies, a million suns in the sky, a hundred thousand million suns in the sky. Robert Oppenheimer, when he saw the first atomic explosion, used or quoted this verse from the Bhagavad Gita. If the light of a hundred million uh, suns were at once seen in the sky, that is what this explosion looks like, he said. But Krishna said that about the divine. The divine is like a light of a million thousand. It's a, it's a theophany. And Krishna then shows himself in this way, and Arjuna gets this divine vision and he can't stand it. He says, I'm unable to bear it. Please go back to your gentle form. So what Hindus believe is that God comes in gentle forms to teach you and be friendly to you, but the divine is really more than, it's the whole cosmos, and you can't stand the cosmic vision. Human beings are not on that plane of consciousness, nor do they need to be, but just be aware that that plane exists. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Okay, Vishnu the Preserver comes in 10 incarnations. One of these is Rama, whom I've just spoken about. The other is Krishna. All of these stories are told in mythological compendia called the Puranas. Puranas means the old stories or the myths of the gods. And the myths of the gods are something, once again, 
that every Hindu knows. They know every story of every god. They know every detail, uh, which isn't surprising when you consider that in the old days when people knew the Bible, uh, they knew every story in, in the Bible. They knew every character, every person, every action. So that's not a surprising thing. It's just that Hindus have many gods, and the gods have many stories, so it's a little harder to do. So Vishnu has, uh, he is the creator as well as the preserver, and he creates bodily. His entire body is the cosmos. He's lying, you can't see it, but he's lying in a cosmic ocean. And this is before time, before space, before creation. He is sleeping, and in his dream vision, out of his body appears a lotus plant, and the stalk of the lotus leads to a blooming lotus up here. When it unfolds, in it sits the four-headed creator god Brahma, who creates each thing on earth. So it is from Vishnu's body in his dream sleep in the cosmic ocean before time. But this is not the one creation or the one time. What happens is that the blink of Brahma's eye is like a hundred thousand million, million, million years of our time. So Brahma is blinking and multiples of these hundred thousand million, millions of years, I don't know numbers, but there are very precise numbers in multiples of four, the longest being the golden age, the second being the, the silver age, the fourth being the bronze age, and the fifth being our age, the bad age, Kali Yuga. We're always living in the bad age, Kali Yuga, the, the worst throw of the die, as they say, Kali. And uh, all of these ages are diminishing in length of time, as well as in virtue and happiness. So why do we have so much suffering on, on earth? Because we're always living in the fourth age called Kali, and only our good actions will get us out of it, but even that won't. And the universe has a finite amount of energy, which is manifested as a cycle. And when the cycle has exhausted itself, it will explode, it will implode. There will be a cosmic cataclysmic flood, the end of time, or time as we know it, sun and moon, everything will go back into the body of Vishnu, and there will be uh, horrible plagues and things, but then there will be new creation once again, and there will be another blink of Brahma's eye. And there are multiple galaxies, multiple worlds with multiple beings, and we are just one of them. The Buddhists and the Jains share this vision of a huge infinite cosmos of, with us being just a tiny part of it as part of their vision. That's the Hindu vision. A vision then comes as 10 incarnations in our time. In our known time, he came in 10 incarnations. One of the, well, the earliest ones were uh, amphibian and animal incarnations, and I'm just showing one. He came as a tortoise, which held up the universe when it was sunk in the ocean. And the second time, he came as a man as, and a boar, that is a pig boar, uh, uh, a tusked animal, who dove into the water and retrieved the goddess Earth, and the goddess Earth is sitting in his arms. So he's always there. In the Gita, this is what Krishna said, Yada yada hi dharmasya glanin bhavati bharata dharma samsthapanarthaya paritranaya cha sadhunam sambhavami yuge yuge In every eon of cosmic time, I make myself come down to earth, I descend in incarnation in order to save cosmic evil from totally engulfing the earth at the wrong time. So there were 10 times when this happened. Rama and Krishna came at the right times. And there is a belief that the Kali Yuga's next incarnation is Kalki, K-A-L-K-I, the white horseman. And he will come and he will destroy all evil on earth. Shiva God of Paradox, he's a destroyer and a creator. The Hindu gods are divided into a triad. The first one is usually Vishnu. Uh, the first one is usually Brahma. You just saw in the lotus that came from Vishnu's navel, there sat a divine agent of creation whose name is Brahma. He is the creator, but he withdraws after creating because after the time of creation, he has very little or nothing else to do. Vishnu's job is to be the preserver or the maintainer of cosmic order. 
So he is the one who comes in incarnation. But there is a third god, Shiva. Shiva is a god of infinite paradox because his function is to destroy everything. Things don't get destroyed by themselves. God has to destroy them. An agent has to destroy them. So Shiva is a destroyer, but it is due to his destruction that new creation is made possible, and we shall see the symbolism of that in just a minute. He is Shiva as the lord of the beasts. This is a pre-Aryan civilization in the Indus Valley. And there we find an undeciphered script and seals in which there are images of gods and goddesses. And this one is a horned, buffalo horned, a yoga practicing god who has four animals on four of his sides. You can't really see them, but there is a rhinoceros somewhere. I can't really see it from here. There's a tiger here. Then there is, um, I think, an elephant and a bull. And um, I think this is a stag. In any case, he's called the Lord of the Beasts. And Shiva, later Shiva of the Hindu gods, the Hindu gods become crystallized around the first century, around the birth of Christ and a little before that. And the Bhagavad Gita is written around that time. That is the time when Hinduism is fully crystallized. The Indus Valley civilization existed and died around 3,500 before Christ. If you go back and look at your handouts, all these timings and everything are given, but you should think of three millennia over which Hinduism spreads, is still in formation, and finally crystallizes with all the law texts, all the gods and everything that Hindus practice today. This happened around the first century very perfectly. And what we practice today is pretty much what was there in the first century, with many, many additions from local cultures and popular cultures. Elephanta shows the entrance to the a Linga shrine. The Linga is the formless form of Shiva, and it shows Shiva in an anaconic form. He shows the masculine principle, the phallic principle, as a, an icon, uh, and this, the, sorry, it's, it's, an, uh, it's an image, not an icon, an anaconic image in which, which is not anthropomorphic, which is not human-like, but it shows Shiva's potential as the great male god. He is a sort of fertility figure, the lord of the beasts. These are very early beliefs. This cave called Elephanta is near Bombay, Mumbai, and you can go there in 45, 25 minutes in a boat ride. It's a fantastically wonderful cave showing all of Shiva's mythologies but, uh, sculpted there by a seventh century family of kings. And here is the Elephanta cave. And here are the three faces of Shiva himself, the paradoxical god. The central face is the face of ascetic contemplation, the yogi. This is the yogi, eyes closed like the Buddha in contemplation. This is the feminine face. Shiva has a female side to him. He has the goddess as half of his body. And this is the female side of him. Powerful, beautiful, energetic. And then the third side, the angry, the warrior-like face, which face, which then becomes the agent of destruction, only of evil, not of good. Shiva means he who brings good and blessing because he destroys evil. Lots of destroyers of evil here. And here he's destroying a demon. You can see his horrific face. He's not a demon, he's destroying a demon. The Tamil devotional hymns to the god Shiva uh, Tamil Nadu was the home uh, of the greatest temples which were ever built to Shiva from the 7th century onwards to almost the 20th. And I recently, my, my most early work, early publication was a book called Poems to Shiva, the hymns of the Tamil saints, which uh, are the hymns that these saints sang when they went to these temples and saw beautiful myths of Shiva carved in sculpture and in bronze images, and they sang about these beautiful images. And I want to read a little bit from these, um, from these hymns in just a minute. But uh, this, is, this was the first hymn that the first of these saints sang. He wears a woman's earring on one ear, riding on a bull, crowned with a pure white crescent moon, his body smeared with ash from the burning ground. He is the thief who stole my heart. Some multiple images here. 
He's riding on a bull. He's wearing a woman's earring. He's crowned with a crescent moon. That means he's cosmic. His body is smeared with ash from the funeral cremation ground because he is beyond good and evil, and he dances in the uh, destruction ground, the, the, the place of death, and he makes it good. He makes death good. And then he is the thief who stole my heart. I love him. This love, this aspect of love, is very, very important in these poems. And this is how he sang it. These hymns are still sung in these great temples. This is the first huge temple built to Shiva, 1010 AD. It just celebrated in 2010 its thousandth anniversary. And George Michel, the architectural historian, and myself wrote the book about the great Chola temple in Tanjaur, which is full of images of Shiva and the worship of Shiva and the hymns. 400 hymn singers sang hymns in this place, you know, every day for this god. And they sang of all the beautiful, multiple beautiful forms of the god, including, most importantly, um, the dance of Shiva. There are also dance dramas that uh, uh, temple dancers dance at this temple. These are not temple dancers, but these are doing, these people are doing the dances that were danced at the temples. And uh, here is Shiva in a beautiful Chola bronze image as the moon crowned lord. I'll be uh, talking about that in a minute. Shiva and his consort Uma Parvati. Shiva with his son Skanda. Uh, Parvati, the consort of Shiva. And here is Shiva as the lord who is half woman. After a while, Parvati was so sad to be separated from him at all, she wanted to be part of his body and he couldn't bear separation either, so she merged into his body. So you can see that she is half of his body. I have a hymn here that I think uh, I have it and I can read it. They also have an elephant-headed son, God of Beginnings. There's always a story of how animal heads appear. In this case, Ganesha is beheaded by mistake and there's no head available, so his uh, father tells the attendant to bring the first uh, creature's head that he sees, and he sees an elephant, so he brings the head and puts it on Ganesha. Ganesha is really a kind of uh, goblin-like god who is the god of all good beginnings and should be worshipped at the beginning of every um, ceremony. Shiva Nataraja is also lord of the dance, and the dance is the one image I want to linger on. The dance is an image of cosmic activity. It is an image of cosmic energy. The dance is not stillness. The dance is ecstatic. It is something where one is not disciplining the body. I'm watching the time, it's 1.45. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the dance is cosmic and it is extremely, um, in some ways it's uh, not possible to understand what it is. It's something other. It shows the otherness of divinity in its total self-absorption, and yet it is a cosmic dance because Shiva dances within nature. Nature dances because of his dance. Every atom, every particle, every human being, all of us move, and his shakti, his energy, is the female side of him. So his cosmic energy takes this shape of this perfect image of a circle, of the circle dance, but it is a dance which is danced within a ring of fire because Shiva is the god who's going to bring in the cosmic destruction, right? Because that is his job. So now we shall see in this Chola bronze uh, the view of his dance, his face which is supremely serene, and his, the moon and various attributes on his hair, uh, the fire in his hand, on in the right hand, I think. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the left hand, but in that hand is the drum, and the drum is the shape of Om, and it is, is a symbol of creation. The moon, the, the 
crescent moon is the symbol of, symbol of creation. There's a skull on his head with the, is a symbol of death. There is a river, Ganges, flowing through his hair, which is also a symbol of creation. The fire is the symbol of death, and the drum is the symbol of creation. That's why I call him the god of enigma and paradox. Um, let me read that hymn, The Lord of the Dance. If you could see the arch of his brow, the budding smile on lips red as the kovai fruit, cool matted hair, the milk-white ash on his coral skin, and the sweet golden foot raised up in dance, then even human birth on this wide earth would become a thing worth having. This is one of the hymns of the saints that I translated in my book, Poems to Shiva. This is my translation, as was the previous one. These had not been translated before. There are 900 hymns, each of which describe Shiva in one of his forms. But sometimes they describe him in all of his forms. And here's one poem which just gives you the Hindu idea of God. See the God. See him who is higher than the gods. See him who is Sanskrit of the Vedas and Southern Tamil, the language in which these hymns are written, and the four, four Vedas. Um, a Sanskrit of the North and Southern Tamil and the four Vedas. See the Lord, see him who dances holding fire in the wilderness of the burning ground. See him who blessed all his saints. See him who wells up as honey in the hot lotus of his lovers. See him who has the unattainable treasure we may gain. See Shiva, see him who is our treasure right here in this temple of Shivapuri. Another one is very wonderful. It says, I can't sing like a true devotee, O oh God, great yogi. How can I worship you? Do not spurn me, perfect being, primal Lord, father who dances in Tillai's Ambalam Hall. I, your servant, have come to see you dance. Seeing your dance, I will praise you. Singing and dancing, I will hail you, crying, O oh Lord, first among the three, you who put an end to the misery of those who sing their praise, your praise, O oh dancer, I, even I have come to see your dance. So these are the kinds of images in which Shiva is uh, worshipped. Very different is the god Krishna, and I'm going to go very quickly through this because I want to end about two o'clock. Krishna, who is this very mischievous child god, and here is a 17th century painting in which Krishna, who is the blue-colored child, the Krishna is always shown as blue or black, Krishna, who is showing a butter ball, uh, giving it to his friends who are all colluding with him and climbing up on the butter pots so that they can steal from the butter pot that has been placed up high. His mother or some other cowherd woman who has kept the butter there to keep it safe from these children and from ants and mice is very upset that Krishna is doing this. But the, the picture deserves a lot more discussion, which I can't do now. But basically, these moments of Krishna's life as a child and a cowherd, born in a small cowherd village incognito, are captured in Krishna's stories. He's a very mischievous god. He's child, he's everybody's child. And he appears in calendar pictures as a butter pot stealing god with his face dripping with butter and a crawling baby. Otherwise, he's the sedu seducer of the cowherd women who plays his beautiful flute at night uh, on, on a moonlit riverbank uh, and with peacocks dancing. And he's gorgeous and all the girls start wanting to dance with him. They all race over and they dance with him. And these paintings go over and over again over these moments of Krishna as his, as his ecstatic dance with the cowherd women of the cowherd village. There's also a, a prankster moment in Krishna, many prankster moments. This is his most famous prank of all. When the women are bathing, he goes and takes all their saris, you know, garments like this, puts them up on the tree, and then they all say, Krishna, Krishna, please give us our garments. We're all naked. We can't come out like this. And Krishna says, oh no, I'm not going to let you come out until you come out naked and one by one and beg me to give each one of you the sari. And then after I've seen you, I'll give you the sari. So they all come. Some of them are holding their breasts. Others are covering their private parts. And here they are. And finally, um, you know, Krishna says, okay, now I can give it to you. But he says, that won't do. 
you have to raise your hands and worship me, and then I will give you the saris. This has many theological uh, interpretations that all devotees want to uh, be with God. All of them want connection with God, but none of them is willing to give up their inhibitions within that relationship until you are naked, your soul is naked before God, and you willingly do it, you are not a devotee. So it's devotion to Krishna is the, the great, oops, what is that? Hmm. Hello, can someone help me? Yeah, that, that's good. All right. The most important thing in Krishna's mythology is his love for one woman, Radha. Even though God multiplies himself and dances with all these other girls, his deepest love is for one woman, and he's shown over and over again with her, his beloved. And this is the soul and God as equals, seeing face to face, so much so that God gives his crown to his beloved. The beloved is always a woman, and God is always male, and Krishna represents that. Okay, now this is the last part. Now quickly run through this. The sacred in everything. There is a huge popular level of Hinduism which is not written about, was not written about in any text. Over the 2,500 years of its history, even these things got written into texts. The texts are in multiple languages. They are told by grandmas, by priests, by anybody, by low caste people, by everybody. Everybody knows the stories. Local stories about local gods and goddesses, ant hills in which snakes live, all natural beings are sacred. You ask anybody in India when you visit there, you know, what are you worshipping? They'll say, oh, I'm worshipping this hill, or I'm worshipping this house, or I'm worshipping this cow, you know. How are they worshipping all these things? They say, well, these are all manifestations of the divine, and I happen to see it here, and a lot of us see it here, so we just worship it. And they worship it with signs and symbols of divinity, by of worship, putting the red powder of auspiciousness there. Uh, yellow is also a color of blessing and good fortune. This is a sacred tree, so it is smeared with all of this. It's a fertility tree. Hanuman, the god, gets worship as a stone. Mango leaves and uh, red powder and yellow powder indicate that a happy festival is happening in this house, a wedding or something like that. A cow is getting ready for the Pongal Harvest Festival. A car is getting ready for maybe its first launch. It's a taxi, so the taxi driver has worshipped his car. It needs the goddess's shakti, her power, her energy. And so the goddess is worshipped by putting the cooling lemons, which will cool her power and not make her burn up the engine. Gods are worshipped in the home shrine by every woman and man and child. Any number of gods, and any god can be in the middle. This person seems to like Hanuman the most, so he stands in the middle. All the other gods are up there in a galaxy. Women are bathing at Banaras in the sacred city, in the sacred river Ganges, going to holy places, bathing in sacred rivers, pilgrimages. These are all parts of Hinduism. A woman is worshipping at a tiny roadside shrine of some local god named Don't Ask Me, or Goddess. A Brahmin saying his Vedic prayers as they were said 2,500, 3,000 years ago. It is uh, Om Tat Savitur Varenyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Diyo Yonam Prachodayate. Oh, bright sun, I worship you at dawn. Please give, make my mind sharp. This is what he's saying. Old widowed lady, a uh, uh, Hindu woman, she won't wear the red dot on her forehead because she's South Indian and the red dot represents good luck and wifehood. The wife is supposed to wear a red dot on her forehead to represent blessing. Uh, old men discussing religion and philosophy. Uh, a husband and a wife with a white, which is the sign of the ascetic god Shiva, and the red, which is the sign of the goddess, both on both the man's and the woman's foreheads. Young girls at the festival of Diwali, the festival of light. Uh, day after tomorrow is the festival to, for the goddess Saraswati, the goddess of music, learning, and the muse. And she's represented in books and instruments. So on that day, we put all our instruments, musical instruments, and our books on a shelf, and we pray to them. And on that day, we can't play those instruments. So you see, they're all being prayed to. Auspiciousness. Women are the custodians of all of this. 
They are participants in the goddess's fertile power. She's earth, the waters, uh, everything fecund and everything which gives life. And women must also, unfortunately, take care of that life and make sure death does not occur. You must have all heard about that horrible custom of sati in which a woman dies in the funeral pyre of her husband. This is the extreme uh, extent to which women are made responsible for the blessing and good fortune. The death of the husband is her fault, so you know uh, she has to do all these rituals. But on the other hand, these rituals give women a great sense of pride and a sense that they have something to do in Hinduism, and you will see in just a minute. This is the goddess Lakshmi, she's beautiful. But goddesses are everywhere, in every village, in every form. There's one major story of the goddess, and the goddess is in, is in many forms, but in the great story, in her divine form, she killed a great buffalo demon and brought light uh, uh, to the earth after darkness had reigned here. So in the harvest time, at the end of the autumn, on the 10th day, this goddess is taken in procession uh, and her clay image is immersed in the waters, asking her to come back and kill the buffalo demon again and bring the harvest cycle and cycle of plenty. So this is a, a, a boundary goddess who's ready to take on any evil people who come there. Uh, this is the clay goddess who will be immersed. This is her pith mask which is placed on her. Her eyes are wide open and she has a third eye of Shiva to burn any evildoers. And uh, many, many images of her all over the place. And red powder is given to her. And here, all brides and all pregnant women and all women who have any sign of fertility are seen as multiforms of the goddess and they are dressed up as if they were goddesses. My cousin is adorning my other cousin for her wedding. And these are calendar pictures. Uh, two women are performing a rite to the goddess. Here's my mother, she's just finished her rite to the goddess. The goddess is made by her, it's made of a coconut with a silver mask and she's decorated her with everything and this is the end of the harvest festival. And here's my mother lighting the auspicious lamps of light for Diwali. Women must cook everything, women must give the sacred food, women must make the lentils for the goddess, women must do everything. So women are the domestic goddesses and they are considered to be the goddesses of the household. And here I am, I am the goddess because I'm pregnant with my first child and my mother and or my mother, this is my mother, and this is my sister, and everybody is giving me a ritual of blessing so that my child and I will be safe through the birth. This was 1980, my daughter is 39 years old. Um, the last thing is women also keep the house safe by drawing great cosmic diagrams. Diagrams of the cosmos, of flowers and fruit and cosmic powers in abstractions and geometric form. Uh, they, they're drawn freehand with rice powder or colored powders, and they're equivalent to the cosmograms or mandalas that the Buddhists and others use to meditate on the forms of the cosmos. And these diagrams are drawn at the threshold of the house and for any auspicious or blessing giving ceremony, so the gods will descend in that place and bless the house. So it is the wives or the, the girls, the daughters, the sisters' duty to make these white and red diagrams. Red is the color of the goddess, it's the color of lifeblood. White is the color of serenity and supremacy of the spirit, which is the male spirit. So spirit and matter, so energy and quiescence, asceticism and fertility, together in harmony, make up the life of the household. So here's my mother making this kolam drawing for my cousin's wedding. The same cousin who was being decorated. Here I am decorating it with the red powder. And we have also decorated the altars on which the two, the bride and the groom, will sit and will have their ceremony. Okay, and this one other festival, this is the harvest festival. My aunt has made all this food and she's given it to the gods. And then finally she takes it out, puts it on a banana leaf and gives the rice balls to the crows. But she knows what the symbolism is. She says, the crows are our ancestral spirits. They come and eat them. So we have to put the rice balls out and then we walk away. They will come and eat them. Even the kolams, which are rice powder, are eaten by ants and birds and they are for them to eat. The idea is everything should be ecologically recycled and this is one of the principles of Hinduism. 
Modern interpreters is my really the last thing. Um, um, but, but before them, there was actually one other section, and I should not forget that. I mentioned the saints. Mahatma Gandhi is called Mahatma, which is a saint, a, a holy person, right? He didn't want that title, but he was called that. But the saints were the people who, interestingly enough, not only worshipped God or became great ascetics like the Buddha and holy men, but the saints in Hinduism were those who questioned the system, those who questioned everything and who had a one-to-one -one relationship with God. They were men, low caste men and women. So I wanted to hear at least one woman's voice. And then after that, I will end with Mahatma Gandhi. So here are some questioning poets from the 11th century. The saints were all poets. They wrote poetry, which was songs, and these songs are called bhajans, and their devotion to God is called bhakti, but their devotion is a fierce devotion of a devotee directly to God. Um, this is what one of them sings from the 11th century Basava. Feet will dance, eyes will see, tongue will sing, and not find content. What else, what else shall I do? I worship with my hands, the heart is not content. What else shall I do? Listen, my Lord, it isn't enough. I have it in me to cleave your belly and enter you, O Lord of the meeting rivers. Another one says, the rich will make temples for Shiva. What shall I, a poor man, do? My legs are pillars, the body, the shrine, the head, a cupola of gold. Listen, O Lord, things standing shall fall, but the moving ever shall stay. Another one. Look here, dear fellow. I wear these men's clothes only for you. Sometimes I'm man, sometimes I'm woman. O Lord of the meeting rivers, I will make wars for you, but I will be your devotee's bride. The woman poet from the 11th century, Akka Mahadevi, says, I love the handsome one. He has no death, decay, no form, no place, no side, no end, no birthmarks. I love him, O oh mothers, listen. I love the beautiful one, with no bond, no fear, no clan, no land, no landmarks for his beauty. So, my lord, why it is Jasmine, he is my husband. Take these husbands who die and decay, feed them to the kitchen fires. It's a very, very provocative poem. Another one where she says, Oh brothers, why do you talk to this woman? Hair loose, face withered, body shrunk. Oh fathers, why do you bother with this woman? She has no strength of limb. She has lost the world, lost power of will. She has turned devotee. She has lain down with the Lord white as jasmine. She has lost her caste. Last poem from her. Look at love's marvelous ways. If you shoot an arrow, plant it till no feather shows. If you hug a body, bones must crunch and crumble. If you weld, the welding must vanish. Loving the Lord is that kind of love. That's a wonderful, wonderful poem. And I'll sing just a couple of lines of Mirabai's favorite, favorite, famous poem, Mira loved Krishna. She lived in the 16th century, a female saint. She became a saint by leaving her husband, by worshipping Krishna, and saying Krishna was her beloved. And this is what she sang. My Lord is Krishna alone, Giridhar Gopa. I don't want anyone else. Father, mother, sisters, brothers, husbands, I don't want any of them. I have planted my love for Krishna, and it grows. It's a creeper. I have watered it with my tears. And Meera says she's completely hooked on the Lord. Let anything happen to her. This is how the poem, the song goes. This was Mahatma Gandhi's favorite singer, his favorite song. Oh, he did.
Because I want questions from you, and it's there's still time. Hmm. Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi was simply Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, lawyer. I could have shown you a picture of him in his uh, three-piece suit. But when he came back to India from South Africa, he had completely transformed himself with the study of the world's religions. He first studied Christianity and Hinduism side by side. And he decided that there were great things in all of the world, world's religions, and he became the foremost modern interpreter of Hinduism as well as modern Indian religion. He said that he was the one who argued that Hindu and Muslim should not fight with each other and gave his life so that um, Hindus and Muslims would live in harmony. Unfortunately, he was shot to death on January 30th, 1948, by a Hindu fanatic, even though he was a Hindu himself. The thing I want to point out here in one sentence for you today is that Gandhi saw the ascetic simplicity, the simplicity of Rama, the simplicity of the teaching of Krishna, the, the discipline of the Bhagavad Gita, which was his favorite text, the yoga of the yogi. He wanted to embody that and make it a living religion, but he fought the caste system. He said the lowliest caste person is the highest person because he or she does what nobody else wants to do. His, his function is to deal with polluting things that the Brahmins will not touch like feces. Does that make him or her a low caste person? How, how can you talk about these things? So he was simultaneously taking things from the ascetic traditions and fighting against the rigidity of caste rules and discrimination against women. He was the strongest feminist of all. He said, my mother is my hero. I want to be like her. I will fast like her because women do the greatest number of fasts for the welfare of their family. I will fast not for my salvation. I will fast for the world. He fasted for Hindu-Muslim unity and the uplift of untouchables and the abolition of the caste system in India. Above all, he said, let every one of us live like a yogi. Let work be our yoga. Everything that we do should be a yoga. And he said, I will spin yarn, cotton yarn, because right now the British have deprived us of our livelihood of uh, handicrafts. And so this will be the symbol with my wheel, the spinning wheel. I will use it as a symbol. I will spin yarn and I will get the British colonials out of our country by using this self-reliance symbol. But the self-reliance symbol was also a symbol of simplicity. Every peasant, every woman, every child can spin yarn and nobody is higher than anybody else. And this is Gandhi's embodiment right here. Along with him was a poet, Rabindranath Tagore. And uh, before that, I should have mentioned the first Hindu who came to the United States and made a real impact on Hinduism was Swami Vivekananda, whom, about whom you can read in the Vedanta Society of America. He established in the 1890s, he came to the Parliament of the World's Religions at Chicago, and he gave a great address in which he spoke for the harmony and ecumenical worship uh, and uh, relationships among the world's religions. And he started a speech, he said, sisters and brothers of America and the world, and he had the greatest applause you would have ever had heard because nobody else, everyone said ladies and gentlemen and things like that. And he said sisters and brothers, and he spread the idea of the immortal soul. Many Americans began to follow the idea of yoga, meditation, contemplation, and the idea of uh, understanding the self and being conscious. So Hinduism came to America in the 1890s through Vivekananda. Gandhi did not come to America, but Tagore did. Tagore even came to Mount Holyoke and spoke, but he did not speak. 
He won the Nobel Prize for Poetry and Literature in 1913. And I want to end with two or three of his short poems, one from Gitanjali, song offering to his great God, who is an unknown God with no name, no form, nothing. Here, this is a very beautiful one. Um, the song that I came to sing remains unsung to this day. I have spent my days in stringing and unstringing my instrument. The time has not come true, the words have not been set right. Only there is an agony of wishing in my heart. The blossom has not opened, only the wind is sighing by. I have not seen his face, nor have I listened to his voice. Only I have heard his gentle footsteps from the road before my house. The live long day has passed in spreading his seat on the floor. But the lamp has not been lit. I cannot ask him into my house, not yet. I live in the hope of meeting with him, but that meeting is not yet. But listen to this. Deliverance is not for me in renunciation. I feel the embrace of freedom and a thousand bonds of delight. You ever pour for me the fresh draught of thy wine of various colors and fragrance, filling this earthen vessel to the brim. My world will light its hundred different lamps with thy flame and place them before the altar of thy temple. No, I will never shut the doors of my senses. The delights of sight and hearing and touch will bear thy delight. Yes, all my illusions will burn into illumination of joy, and all my desires ripen into fruit of love. A sad poem when his wife died. No, no, she's no longer in my house. I've looked in every corner nowhere to be found. In my house, Lord, there's such precious little space. What goes away from it cannot be retraced. But your house is infinite, all-pervasive, and it's there, Lord, I've come to look for her. Here I stand beneath this evening sky and look at you, tears streaming from my eyes. There's a place from which, from where no face, no bliss, no hope, no thirst can ever be snatched from us. It's there, I've brought my devastated heart. So you can drown, drown, drown it in that source. Elixir of deathlessness, no longer in my house. May I recover its touch in the universe. It's a very touching poem. But then he sings, this is the last one. This I must admit, how one becomes two is something I haven't understood at all. How anything ever happens, or one becomes what one is, how anything stays a certain way, what we mean by words like body, soul, mind, I don't fathom. But I shall always observe the universe quietly, without words. How can I, even for an instant, understand the beginning, the end, the meaning, the theory of something outside of which I can never go? Only this I know, that this thing is beautiful, great, terrifying, various, unknowable, my mind's ravisher. This I know, that knowing nothing, unawares, the current of the cosmos's awareness flows towards you. Thank you. Cycle. And I'm wondering, 
Is there any way to reconcile those two views, or are they just totally and completely irreconcilable and, and different from one another? Um, if the question is uh, reconcilable for Hindus or reconcilable for everyone, um, uh, is, is there, are, are, are they are they so are they so completely different, or am I missing? Some some thread that maybe I see you want to see. But could I ask you quickly? Do you feel that they're different? Do you yourself feel that they're very different, completely different? Can you see yourself coming over a little bit to that other vision? Of course. You can. Oh, yeah. So then they are not completely different because you've already done it, right? I mean, that was my question. Is I can I I can understand if you say no, it's so completely unimaginable, I can't do it. But you're imagining it. Well, so where do you see the crossover? Well, well here, okay, we, we, we don't want to die. Yeah. We want to live forever, and, and our idea... We meaning... In the West. In the West. And, and Some people don't. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that's true. Yeah. But, that, but those, those whose lives are comfortable do. Mm -hmm. and, and, and imagine mm -hmm. um, that life will not end. But that some, on, on some level, will go on, yeah. um, and it, enjoying even more than we do now. Right. Um, we don't want to escape. So right. Yeah. Let's go with that because I think many will disagree with some parts of your statement about we don't. You know, some people welcome death. And all that. But, but the more important thing that you're saying you is that you the escape. The escape is not a concept that's part of the Western world. You're yeah. absolutely right. And I think I can address that very briefly. Um, it seems to me that if, let's take modern Indians like myself. Um, we, you know, not everybody is traditional. Not everybody believes in karma or rebirth. Um, even Mahatma Gandhi studied Christianity. His thought was greatly formed by his early uh, study of Christianity. Um, colonialism, 400 years of colonialism and English education have changed Indians forever. Modernity, uh, as globalizing modernity has also changed Hinduism as a religion. And within Hinduism, there are so many dissent groups and so on. What I would what like to say is that the, the, maybe I would focus more on the ideal of the perfect person. How Mahatma Gandhi, even between 1910, 1915, and 1948, captured the, not only the Hindu, but the Indian imagination uh, by being this kind of uh, uh, person who renounced something. The question is whether he did that to liberate himself. He actually said he didn't. He did that for other people. He had an altruistic motive. And I think the Bhagavad Gita is the text, the central text for that. Most Hindus accept that as the greater text. They don't just want to escape or quit. In fact, Krishna says you cannot quit and you should not quit. You should live this life well. But he gives you that other vision as a possibility for you. By living your life, you are already working towards your liberation. This is the most attractive vision for Hindus, even modern Hindus. That, you know, you live in the world, even Tagore goes in extreme. He says, I will not shut my senses, but he, his poetry is also very ascetic. So this idea of a certain discipline uh, is not necessarily for quitting the world and renouncing the world, but for living in the world better, a certain discipline is needed. The ideal of yoga is the greater ideal rather than liberation being quitting everything. Does that make sense to you? Which is a closer vision, I think. There are many hands, many other hands here. Yeah, I, I was wondering, is it possible to have access to that class website that you showed at the beginning? I don't think so, because, well, um, let me ask, let me ask about the copyright permission. I have a feeling, I, I think I can give permission to certain people, but I don't think I can give it to the entire class because it's the Mark Holyo website, it's not mine. And I do have to ask about the permissions issue. If there are particular things you want access to, I can send you some material. And even there, I'm restricted on what I can send. Okay? Things that I have produced myself, I'm happily willing to send you. The other thing is there is something called Dropbox, 
which is a, a place where you can create a website where everyone can access things, and I'm happy to put my things up there and you can all access it if uh, Barbara or somebody can figure out Dropbox. It's, it's something that people use all over the world, apparently, to send pictures and things like that. So I'd be happy, very happy to do that. Okay? Yeah. So, so your question, you were continuing that question. Unless someone else has a different question. Uh, what were you, were you going to say when I cut you off here? It should be brief because I do want others to have a little, you know, just. No, just, just going, going back, going back to the, to the liberation. Is there, is there, is there any sense that that is? Uh, I can hear. Okay. It, 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 is there, is there any sense in which that is some sort of continuation, or is it, or is it the total cessation of? Okay, um, this is what's interesting. Um, some people actually look forward to rebirth. Uh, the worst, people in the worst situation think that if their karma is good in this life, they're going to get a better birth next life. So it's like heaven, you know, a better birth. I'll be born as a Brahmin or I'll be born as a king. That's a, I'm talking about traditional old-fashioned Hindus, not modern Hindus. Nobody thinks like that now. Uh, very few, you know, people do that. But the next thing would be uh, people see rebirth as a good thing because there's so much. It's it's this idea. There's so much I want to do and see. So maybe I'll be reborn as a bird and see my grandson. You know. So there is karma and rebirth give you many ways of rebirth being good. To really want to be completely for cessation of everything, which is uh, which is what the Buddhists say. But you see, the Hindu vision is different. It's sat chit ananda. Being, consciousness, and bliss. The way it is described, when Yadna Valkya, that sage, told his wife the teaching, he ended by saying, it's a consciousness in which you will never believe. You will be nothing but pure, shining, happy consciousness. There will be no sorrow, there will be no death. You will be the best thing you ever will be. It's bliss, ananda. That is why all the people who renounce the world are called Vivekananda, Tapasyananda. It means they're going to be supremely blissful consciousness. It's very different from the cessation of everything. Okay. We should give the opportunity for the people down south to ask any questions they might. No questions? Okay. Yeah, there's one, there's one here. Hi, thank you very much. I enjoyed your lecture. Um, I had a uh, amateur interest in Maybe you should speak closer to the mic, I think, or maybe I just come to you. Turn it on, turn it on, maybe. Somebody should have that, please. I would like yeah, to hear you articulate um, the difference between Hinduism and the religion that the Greeks and the Romans, mm -hmm. uh, they had multiple gods. Yeah. Um, Worship good. the gods, and you you did sacrifice, and you said certain prayers. You were a good citizen. Yeah. What is the difference between paganism, essentially? What are the characteristics of Hinduism that we don't call we call it a religion, and we certainly wouldn't call it paganism? Religion, uh, Hinduism had a growth. Let, let me put it this way: the there is a theory, and I think it's a correct theory, that the Vedic religion, which is different from Hinduism, Veda and the Vedic religion, just if you stopped at, at 1200 before Christ, that was a religion. And that would be closer to Greek religion than anything after 1200 before Christ. Okay, so you're stopping back in ancient time. And uh, I don't know how long the Greek religion went on in its highest form, but that was quite ancient too. Hinduism is a religion which has grown over 3,000 years. And I just now said in my lecture that the crystallization of Hinduism took place between nine, about 1,000 before Christ to about the first century. That's the 1,000 year period. And I went on growing after that in many different ways, including the songs of the saints that I sang. Those are from, some of them are from the 18th century. They're still growing. So it's a very different, there are many gods. Uh, I didn't explain the idea of gods, perhaps. The idea is that the god is the highest manifestation that you can imagine or that you could see visibly in embodied form, uh, you know, in an icon, the icons and images that are worshipped 
Your imagination sees the divine in there. It's a representation of that which is present but you cannot see. The idea is that manifestation. The divine, which, is not, which doesn't have any form, manifests itself in multiple forms. The Greeks had no such idea. Now, going back to the Vedic religion, the Vedic religion is just like the Greek religion. They do believe that each thing was a god, that Indra was a god, and dawn was a god, and the sun was a god, and fire was a god, and that's all. They were. There was no idea of manifestation or the divine being. This is all from the Upanishads, those speculative texts which say, what was there before the gods? Is there anything other than the gods? And who are these gods anyway? Why must we sacrifice? These are all very radical texts. The Buddha asked the same question and then he quit Vedism altogether. But the Hindus remained in it and built upon it. One other thing, the theory I wanted to tell you, the Indo-European theory is a correct theory in terms of both language and religion and culture. That the Indian culture, as we had it in the Vedic period in uh, 1200 BC, was brought by nomads from Central Asia or further west. And this was a group called the Indo-European language groups, family speakers, which languages have descendants stretching from Ireland to India. That's the Indo Celtic, Germanic, Teutonic, Scandinavian, Italian, Romance, you know, uh, Iranian. All of these languages and all of the religions were very connected to each other. They were, in fact, there was probably one Ur religion, Icelandic religion, Celtic religion is similar to the Vedas. This is why Western scholars have studied the Veda more than anything else. They all stop at about 800 before Christ because they're interested in the Indo-European connection. Linguistically, the word ignis, uh, um, which is fire, agni in, in Vedic, and Ogon in Russian, uh, Pater is father, Pitr is father in Sanskrit, Mater is mother, Matri is mother, uh, Lux, night, uh, Nakta in Sanskrit. You know, I can give you uh, Equus in Latin as a horse, Ashwa in Sanskrit Vedic. So the early religion was a co-religion of the Greeks. The two epics, Iliad and Odyssey, are counterparts of the Ramayana and Mahabharata. Even the stories are similar. These are not accidents. These are part of a language group, a family which spread all over from Europe to India. I fully believe this. We should finish now. We should finish now. Uh, should we take one last question and be very brief? Yeah, one last, and we'll finish. It's just about 2.30. Yeah. So it'd be just uh, thank you for an amazing mm -hmm. lecture. Mm -hmm. um, Hinduism appeals to the aesthetic and intellectual senses right. on a daily basis through ritual and prayer, as yeah. you showed us in India. Mm -hmm. How do modern Indians living in the United States and other countries continue religious observances? Yeah, they're, very, they're flourishing very greatly. Um, they have built very wonderful Hindu temples in many of the major cities in America, in Atlanta, in uh, Houston, in Pittsburgh, um, and they, they, they have temple religion. Home religion has been followed. Home religion is the easiest one to carry. Your gods, you can pack them up in a little box and bring them with you. And you can, you can do your religion even on a train or anywhere. So that has never been a problem. Uh, functions and rituals, all the festivals are celebrated, all the temples put out the calendars. We celebrated Navaratri, the festival of the goddess Diwali. There's no problem at all. These festivals bring us together. There are huge Hindu communities in the US, there's no problem. The one issue is more Indian customs such as arranged marriage, which are not just a Hindu thing. Muslims also have arranged marriage, and Christians also have arranged marriage in India. So that's a South Asian issue, not a Hindu issue. Okay, so thank you.